Good morning. I'm delighted to be here at Zeitgeist and talk to you about what is one of the most fascinating and monumental times in the entire history of the computer industry. And that's the coming together of two eras, a change that's absolutely phenomenal. The end of Moore's Law <laughs> and the beginning of the AI era. And we stand right at that junction. What is Moore's Law anyway? We hear all this end of Moore's Law. What does it mean? Moore's Law, first of all, it is not a law. It is not a law. It was a prediction by Gordon Moore, made originally in 65 and then modified in 1975, that the number of devices we'd have on a chip would double every two years. But that prediction became reality. The industry stretched and tried to develop it. What's the effect of that? Pull this cell phone out of your pocket. It has more memory than the, all the memory made for every computer in the world in 1970. And you buy it for one millionth the cost of one computer at that time. So it's a phenomenal change, but it's coming to an end. And you can see it on this curve here. We've begun to deviate. In fact, we're now about a factor of 15 off of Gordon Moore's original production. Of course, Gordon said this, all exponentials have to come to an end. By definition, they have to come to an end. This one is coming to an end. We're behind by about eight years, and it's probably going to accelerate. Well, what's, what have we done with all that amazing computer power? We turned it into faster computers. That's what we really did with it. And if you look at the speed at which computers have accelerated since the 1980s, it's amazing. If automobiles made the same progress, you would drive across the country in two minutes. And by the way, when you arrived in New York or Washington, you'd pack your car up into something a little bigger than a cell phone and stick it in your pocket, and you wouldn't have to pay for parking in New York City. Very important. Well, what's happened with all that computer power? We all use computer. How many people think their computer is too fast? <laughs> How many think it's too slow? Yes, of course. What have we done with all that computer power? Well, the first thing is we built lots of new capability with it. We built the World Wide Web. We built programs like Google Search. We built things that do things for us, including, by the way, automatically answer emails if you want it. <laughs> but we did something else. We liberated programmers. We developed programming languages and systems for them that would increase the productivity of programmers so that they could write more software. How did we do it? We gave them hardware that was cheap and free so they didn't have to worry about how fast the program ran. This is a great curve out of a, out of a paper from some colleagues at MIT. So they start with a program, matrix multiply. You all remember matrix multiply, maybe from high school? You know, multiply two matrices. Um, they wrote a version of this in Python. Python is the programming language that many courses teach programmers for their first language. It's what many people on the web use. It's an incredibly powerful programming language. They wrote it in Python. Then they rewrote it in C. C is what things like Windows and Linux are written in. It ran 50 times faster just by rewriting. Then they took advantage of parallelism that exists in the machine, and they optimized the memory behavior. And they took advantage of some special instructions that are inside an Intel processor. The result was the final program ran 63,000 times faster. Then that's a lot of hardware progress. So we've liberated all this capability and given it to programmers so they can write programs faster. So what does this all mean? It's coming to an end. Are we going to have computers in the future? Well, we're certainly investing in research. It is really research. It's things going on in laboratories that physicists are working on to try to invent new computers. Quantum computing is one method we're exploring. Quantum computers work in an entirely different way. Conventional binary computers, a bit is one or zero. In a quantum machine, a qubit, the equivalent, can be probabilistically somewhere between one and zero. That gives it incredible computing capability, together with a thing called quantum entanglement, what uh, Einstein once called spooky action at a distance. Those two things together enable us to do some computations, not all, dramatically faster. 
But one very important computation they can do faster is to factor very large integers. And guess what all our cryptography systems currently rely on? That it is hard to factor very large integers. So if quantum computers become available, we're going to have to redo the way we do cryptogra cryptography everywhere. There are other alternative mechanisms. Uh, one of them are, are so-called carbon nanotubes. Another approach, more similar to conventional silicon, but offering advantages in terms of the ability to pack more devices in and also stack them in three dimensions so that we might actually get a technology that could bridge across there. So this era is coming to an end. At the same time, another era has just taken off. We've been working on artificial intelligence for more than 60 years. I've had an opportunity over my life to meet most of the early pioneers, including the people that invented the term artificial intelligence. It was 60 years of predictions that were unfulfilled, massively unfulfilled. We didn't get close to what we thought we could do. And then, all of a sudden, there was a tipping point. And that tipping point came, really became visible in 2016, when AlphaGo, the computer program from DeepMind, beat the world's Go champion. This is an incredible breakthrough. And it was incredible not because it just beat it, but because of the way it won the game. Previously, computers had first beat humans in checkers, then several decades later in chess. But those were primarily done by brute force. They were done by making the, giving the computer the ability to search further than most people could search. AlphaGo won in a completely different way. It learned to play Go. It made moves which master Go players labeled as creative, unusual, and it won the game easily. It used reinforcement learning. How did it learn how to play Go so well? By playing itself and continually optimizing the algorithm that would win in every step. The basis for all this revolution is an important insight that we call deep learning. The key to understanding deep learning and why the breakthrough occurred in machine learning, very simple. What are human brains good at? They're good at learning. I have a three-month-old granddaughter. By the way, if you want to know how to inspire old people, ask them to talk about their hopes for their grandkids. <laughs> I have a three-month-old granddaughter. When she was born, she didn't know anything. She knew hungry, wet, cold, a few very basic things that are built into our evolutionary system. She didn't know her mother and her father, but she does today. She didn't know when people smile at you and you're a baby, you smile back because that makes people really happy. She learned that. She'll learn to talk. She'll learn to walk. All that, we're incredible learning machines. That's what the human brain is. So what do we try to do now in machine learning? Build something that can learn. Build something that can learn. So we use these artificial neural networks. They are not replicas of human brains. That's a very bad way to think about them. They're inspired by the structure that exists in a human brain. And they basically, we have a set of inputs on one side, we have a bunch of layers in the middle, and we have a set of outputs. And then we have weights that say, if this weight is this from this input, then that's how much it counts on that input. Very simple, very simple to understand. That's the key insight, the key piece of technology. So, how do we use these? The first thing we do is we train it. Remember, it's stupid. It knows nothing to begin. It's empty. Those weights are all meaningless. So you begin by training it. You take an image you want to recognize. Cat, fierce cat, I suppose, if you want to. But you take a picture of cat. Then you train it. You say, okay, it's a cat. Now let's figure out what those weights should be so that when I put an image of cat over here, I get out cat there. Train cat. Train with lots of pictures of cats. Create another node. Dog. Train with lots of pictures of dogs. Create another node. Elephant. Train with lots of pictures of envelope. Eventually, you get a massive neural network with lots of inputs here, lots of outputs, gigantic number of nodes in between. These things are massive. Think tens, hundreds of thousands of nodes in between, millions of weights. And you train it, and you train it, and you train it. Computationally incredibly expensive. 
Now it's trained. Now it's got a set of weights. Then you take your picture of cat, you put it in here, and boom, cat lights up over there. But remember, it's all dependent on that training. If I train, if I tell it pictures of elephants are cats, it's going to recognize elephants as cats. It doesn't know anything about it. What it knows is statistical properties about what the images look like and how it's been trained. So why now? How come all of a sudden we've been able to make this breakthrough? Well, two things occurred that were really crucial. First of all, we have enough data to train this. We have enough images on the World Wide Web that have been labeled that say, this is a picture of a cat, this is a boat, this is a house, this is a truck. And so we've got massive number of images. In fact, the ImageNet database has 80,000 objects in it and at least 500 images for every single object in the database. That becomes the training set. Then massive computational resources. We couldn't have done this without cloud computing and the massive resources that I can bring together in cloud computing. So you need lots of computing time, especially for the training effort. Put those two together, and you can build something that really can do things that begin to be human-like in terms of their ability to recognize things. Another breakthrough, Alpha Zero. How far can you take reinforcement learning? Can you teach a computer program to play a game when all it knows are the rules? Doesn't know anything about strategy. Doesn't know how to open. Doesn't know how to close and get checkmate. Only knows the rules. So the DeepMind people tried that experiment. They built something called Alpha Zero to play chess. Only the rules. It played 44 million games of chess. Do a computation. That's more than the number of grandmasters in the world will play in their lifetimes combined. 44 million games on thousands of processors in a 24-hour period. And in 24 hours, it was good enough to become the best chess player in the world. So really radically throwing lots of computational power at it, constantly making it better. Today, we're beginning to see these applications get used in lots of critical things. Obviously, if we want to have autonomous vehicles or we want to be able to see things going on in situations, but autonomous vehicles are the greatest example. You have to be able to recognize a stop sign, a stoplight, a passenger, a bicyclist, a motorcyclist, and you've got to be able to do it in real time. So you train. You train on lots of images, many, many images, and you begin to recognize those things. You've got to be able to tell a pothole in the road or a, something sitting in the road blocking you from a shadow being cast by the sun across the road. Turns out, very difficult problem. How do you know? You're driving down the road. You see a big black spot in the middle of the road. How do you know instantly that's just the shadow from a tree that's there? It's not a hole in the road. It's not something lying on the road that I have to avoid. So lots of training goes into this. Uh, one of the new great results from some colleagues at the medical school working with people like Google Brain, uh, looking at images of skin lesions and determining whether they're malignant or benign. Again, you start with lots of images that have been classified by people who are dermatologists. They give you that information. You use that to train the neural network. And then this system can do inference and can match the results for a board-certified panel of dermatologists. Translation between two different languages. So here's the old technology in dark blue. Here's what we're able to do by adding a neural network-based mechanism for doing translation. And this little sliver on the top is how much better somebody who is truly bilingual can do in translating. So we're getting very close to human level performance. Again, very dependent on the quality of the training data. The, the neural network does not know anything. So, isn't this an incredible dilemma you're approaching, you're telling us about? Moore's law is ending. Computational power will not be increasing at the same rate. At the same time, we've all of a sudden found this range of applications which is incredibly powerful, 
incredibly liberating, which people can use for all kinds of things, but it requires more computer power. What are we going to do about that dilemma? Well, happily, these machine learning applications are highly structured. In fact, that old matrix multiply example, they look a lot like that in their inner core. So what do we do? We move away from general purpose processors and we design special purpose processors that we call accelerators that perform that function very well and are optimized for doing that. And then we create new programming languages for describing these machine learning algorithms. TensorFlow, for example, is the, is the version that Google Brain has created and put in open source. How fast can we make these machines? This is TPU1, the first TensorFlow processor from Google. It does 92 million million operations per second. Roughly 100 times the throughput that you would get out of a general purpose processor. It doesn't do everything a general purpose processor does, but it does machine learning really terrifically well. So that's the way we're going to make advances at a time when Moore's Law will not deliver it as easily as it has in the past. So let me talk, turn now to the big question. What about artificial general intelligence? So far, the examples I've shown you are sometimes referred to as applied AI or weak AI. There are things where the system can exhibit what appears to be human intelligence, but if you probe it very deeply, you'd find out it really doesn't know anything at all the way we think of knowing something. Ask a five-year-old why that's a cat, that's a dog, and that's an element, and a five-year-old can tell you. A neural network cannot exactly tell you why something is a cat or a dog. And it certainly can't do a, a more complex thing, like explain why dogs are domesticated, but it's hard to domesticate an elephant for your house. It can't explain these simple things. It can't generalize in a way that humans really can. So most of the research world, a lot of the research world, is focused on thinking about this artificial general intelligence problem. Some people believe it's 10 years away. Lots of people believe it's at least 25 years away. Some believe that it's 40 years away. But I think the real question that I ask is, when will this technology ever write a sonata that is as good as Beethoven? Or write a play that speaks to the human condition the way Shakespeare does? Or create a piece of art that looks like a Picasso with only a few simple lines that convey an image. Those are challenges that are so far, far beyond what our computers can do. But we have another challenge, and this is a challenge that applies not only to the entire industry, but to all of us still in the academic world, which is to ensure that artificial intelligence gets used for the greater good, that it becomes an amplifier for people's abilities and their dreams and their ambitions, that it makes life better for people. That's going to require us to think hard about things like bias and how training sets affect bias. It's going to require us to think hard about how we find jobs for people as their skills and their jobs are changed by the emergence of artificial intelligence. We need to think about human-centered artificial intelligence not replacing humans, but making life better for all of us. Thank you.